Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. Good afternoon, everybody. It is the Steve Jones Show on a Tuesday. News Radio 1070 WKOK. Matt Catrillo here with you. Steve will soon be there from the Sunbury Motors studio. Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. And online at sunburymotors.com. Lots to get to today. I want to start with the national championship game briefly, and then we'll get into what's wrong with Pennsylvania football, because we'll have our guests centered around that today. Obviously, Alabama is back to where it was not too long ago, two, three seasons ago, where they're Tier A and everybody else is Tier B. I thought we might have been in a track meet about midway through, what, the second quarter, especially after Ohio State was able to tie the game when they got the strip sack. But Alabama's defense just rose to the occasion, and then they they just became too much. And... We either thought it was going to be a track meet or it would be a blowout in Bama's favor and it being a 52-24 to win for Bama. So this wasn't talked about a whole lot going into the game because I guess we wanted to see how Ohio State would play the Tide. But since they've gotten crushed and we're only able to hang for a quarter and a half at best, we need to stop with the notion, especially toward Notre Dame, that they didn't deserve to be in the college football playoff. Because really, let's think about let, let's let's be real. Nobody was going to keep up with Bama, which leads to this this narrative that I have been totally against from the get go. That oh, this team doesn't didn't deserve to be in because they got blown out. Blowouts happen in playoff games, but the team a team could still deserve to qualify or just qualify for a chance to play a national title or get in the playoffs. Happens in college football. Happens in the NFL. It happens in March Madness. Happens all the time. Happens in baseball, NBA, NHL. It happens. So we just got to get over this narrative that somebody doesn't deserve to be in because they got blown out. Which, again, leads to all of my many opinions against and needing for expansion of what's still the flawed college football playoff system. But we'll just leave it at that for now. And also, one other quick note, I should say, with Heather Dinich was on with Steve yesterday. You missed to go out to stevejonesshow.com, check it out. Also on the Facebook page and Twitter page. And when she was talking to all the, uh, the, the group of five commissioners and the Sun Belt Conference commissioner said that the ex- expansion wouldn't help as much, I guess maybe that's why Steve says it might go to 10. It should go to 10 so you can get more in. And I'd be okay with that. But again, it's got to be... You can still have that that narrative. To me, if you were to go to 8, you would have your 5 Power 5 Conference champs. And then that would open up to the last 3 for I would guess to bro- to be the group of any group of five conference champs the best of those groups and then if there's any other power five teams that are just flat out better record wise and everything else not just because of the stupid eye test but be, if they're just better record wise then they should get in but if you go to 10 then it's just conference champs 
the five Power Five conference champs and the Group of Five conference champs. At least that's how I would do it. But that again, that that's why it's never going to be perfect. I get it, but I've I've always been the advocate of if you win your conference championship, you should have a chance to play for the champion for a main league championship or whatever. If you win your conference, you deserve to be in. That's always been my sentiment there. And I guess we'll have to leave it at that for now. But getting to what's wrong with these Pennsylvania football teams. <laughs> I'll start with the Eagles. John McMullen, ESPN South Jersey, is going to join us at 335. <laughs> if anybody watched Jeffrey Lurie's press conference yesterday, if any Eagle fan watched that entire 45 minutes like I did yesterday, you probably lost many brain cells. Because the owner flat out embarrassed himself with that press conference yesterday. I have no idea where this team is going. I don't think he does either. And it's very clear that nobody had a clue these last couple seasons. It's very clear now. And when the Eagles won in 2017, it may seem like a miracle that they won the Super Bowl. But guess what? Guess who's not there anymore? Joe Douglas? Frank Reich and others alike from that group that have now gone on to other opportunities in the league. It seems to me like these people, Lurie, Roseman, Doug Pete to some extent, didn't know what they were doing. It's it's almost like you're the you're the lazy kid in the cl- in the class that pays off a smart kid to do your homework for you. And, and then you get an A in the class or get an A on an assignment. That's kind of how I feel like this was for the Super Bowl when the Eagles won the Super Bowl. They brought in people that they that knew what they were doing, that they probably wouldn't have to do much, just maybe say, quote-unquote, collaborate on a few things like they said they did, and they won a Super Bowl. They've all left. Now it's up to them, and look where things have gone. And they thought that they can use the Super Bowl as like, now we've learned everything. Now we can do what back go to our, back to our our way of thinking again, and look where things have gotten worse than what it was before you went on the Super Bowl run. I I, I just don't get it. I, I really don't. But as far as head coaching candidates go, I'm starting to get sold on Deuce Staley. Now with a couple of with a couple of Asides. The fact that you've seen Malcolm Jenkins, a former player, Rodney McLeod, current player, and others say, I want to play, I would want to play for Deuce, so I want to play for Deuce. You know, everyone at when and you hear all the reports saying everybody when when Deuce speaks, everybody listens. He's got like this great command of the locker room the last couple seasons. And what's also, I think, in his favor is he survived three coaching tenures. He was under Andy Reid, towards the end of his regime, he was under Chip Kelly for his three years that he was there, and now he's been under Doug P for the five years that he was here. So that does say something. And I think, and even Jeff Lurie even said, one of the few coherent things he said in his press conference yesterday, he wants the next head coach to be a leader of men. I think Deuce Staley would certainly qualify for that. I certainly Ah. do. But Steve, yeah, yeah, yeah. can he, if he chooses to call plays, can he call plays? Can he, could he put himself, can he, can he hire two really solid coordinators? Because that's what he needs. And then we have, we don't know how we can manage a game. That would be other unknowns too. Those are the risks you take with somebody like Deuce Staley. But I think with the way the roster is right now, I think it would be a good hire as long as he as long as he hires good coordinators and a good coaching staff to surround him because obviously he would still have very little experience in terms of those things I just mentioned. It's very fascinating what this is, and I haven't even gone to the Steelers yet. They're a whole other mess. Oh, we'll get into that with Neil Kulong today. Yeah, we'll talk to Neil about that. The Steelers' problem is uh, diametrically different than the Eagles. The Steeler problem is that 
they have been good enough over the years to be in contention most years, which then brings with it consistent lower draft positions. Over time, you pay a price for that. Usually it's fast. Usually it's fast. You know, when I mean fast, usually like, you know, five years and, you know, now you're drafting up for a couple of years, then you work your way back. The Steelers have been good enough over the last 20 years where they've kept themselves in contention for the most part. Not always, but for the most part, they've kept themselves in contention. And that happens when you have a Hall of Fame quarterback where you're drafting in the 20s all the time. And it's supposed to catch up with you sooner rather than later. Uh, But for the Steelers, it turned out that it's caught up with them later. How about that? For the Eagles, the Eagles haven't been like that. They were a contender with McNabb. They hung in for a long time. Then they kind of like worked their way through the wilderness for a little while, and then it looked like they were, you know, they won the Super Bowl, obviously. You know, but again, it's so hard staying at the top when you're not drafting near the top. It's a big part of it. So they're really different issues. And plus, I mean, there's less hate in Pittsburgh. <laughs> I like to call it there is more expectation in Philadelphia. Expectation for what? To win. Okay, I'm not – okay, this is not meant to be a flippant statement. Expectation of what? I mean, seriously, what have you won? Expectation. The Steelers have won – I mean, look, I hope everyone understands. I'm not sitting here as a fan of either team. But the Steelers have won six Super Bowls. You've been to three. What's your expectation? You're not a Super Bowl contender every year. You don't get to the Super Bowl and, you know, get you won one. One. I mean, in your own division, you're dead last in Super Bowl wins. Dead last. And guess what? The next one you win, you're still dead last. Hey, that's where you are. Expectation of what? Dallas has won what? Five. Five. Giants, the Giants have four. Have Redskins, or Washington is three. It's three. And Philadelphia's won one. We have an expectation of what? To become a consistently winning franchise, championship winning franchise I should say. Because they've been a winning franchise under Lurie somehow. But they haven't been a consistent championship winning franchise. There's the difference and that's been the expectation of this fan base for a long time. And then we thought we were going to get it when they won in 2017. Because it looked like they had they finally, the owner finally learned how to win a Super Bowl by surrounding himself with people. And if those people left, he can do it again. We thought we had a a competent head coach that knew knew how to navigate things. We thought we had a a good franchise quarterback to continue to lead the way, even though there was the backup that led to the Super Bowl. You thought you had all these things, and three years later, it's it's all a mess. You won one, and you get spoiled by it. I'm not, no, that that was not meant to be flippant. All right, in all honesty, hey, here's here is one of the single biggest problems I find. There there are two huge problems I find today with with how we are with sports. So let's I'll start with the the most simplistic one. And these are two things I've talked about before. So this is not going to be a, a foreign conversation, anybody. One is, and I've said this, and I'll always preface this, this is not, capital N, capital O, capital T, is not ESPN's fault. When they do SportsCenter, it's a highlight-based program. Highlights, highlights, highlights. And we're seeing every incredible dunk, every incredible goal in soccer and hockey, every incredible catch, magnificent run, fabulous, you know, hit, great base running, whatever. 
to the point where we've been so inundated with spectacular highlights. Let's just do something simple in golf. Okay, let's take a look at the Century Classic. Okay, we're watching the Century Classic. Every shot lands within five feet of the hole on the highlights. Now, ESPN's trying to show you the best. So that's why we're seeing that, to the point where it makes all of it look easy. You become almost desensitized to the greatness of it because there's so many great plays that they now end up making look easy. Everybody thinks they can make a one-handed catch. Okay. Well, now let's get to the other part. We have completely lost perspective and an appreciation for how hard it is to win. It's hard to win. That's why you, when you win, you appreciate it. You don't take it for granted. Winning is difficult. It's really hard to do. This is what we expect. Expect what? The league isn't designed to do what you're trying to do. The league is designed for you to have a good run and fall back and then rebuild and have a good run again. That's what it's designed to do. That's why what New England's done and what Pittsburgh's done, Pittsburgh hasn't won the six Super Bowls New England has in this century. Pittsburgh's won two of them in this century. Okay? The league's not designed to do that, where you're always contending every single year. So now you got to figure out, how do I get back there? How do I do it? Who do I draft? Who do I sign as a free agent? Who do I coach it? Right? Instead of, instead of saying, everybody let us down, well, guess what? You got old in certain spots. You hung on to a couple guys too long in certain spots. And your offensive line ruined your quarterback because they got hurt and they got old. You can talk about the quarterback all you want, okay? But would you like to operate behind that group? Lost Booker in the preseason, lost Dillard. Peters is so far past his prime. Right? I'd say he's like where the suit is, but I'm trying to remember the suit had a prime. <laughs> I mean, that's the problem that you have here. And they have not drafted in prime spots the last couple of years. And also, I and also, it's interesting because with Mason Rudolph, for example, he's a backup quarterback. But he wasn't quite the same after his concussion last year. Do you think... Carson, when people you know, remember what David admitted, they were in the playoffs with Carson Wentz last year. In fact, Carson Wentz is a huge reason they got to the playoffs last year. He overcame, in some ways, his team to get to the playoffs, especially a wide receiver. And then Jadavian Clowney smacked his head on that hard turf. He hasn't quite been the same since. These are all logical questions that fans have to ask other than, like, he stinks, get rid of him. Yo, whoa, whoa, like, let's think our way through this a little bit. Even though for entertainment value, you know, your level of hate's actually rather entertaining. (laughs) (laughs) But it's hard to win. You guys all think it's easy. I know it's easy, though. Taking a break. Back with more in a moment here on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Taking your calls at 800 795 9565. This is The Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now, from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. The suit texted me something about being forever in his prime. See, that's what I was going to say. Uh, you misspelled prime. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, kidding. I'm just kidding. He says, 
we were talking about what do you expect for your team. He says, I expect a Pro Bowl center to snap the ball cleanly to a 6'5 quarterback. And when he doesn't, for someone to just cover the football before going in the end zone. <laughs> He's not wrong there. Just a bit bitter. <laughs> <laughs> I feel him, though. <sighs> Well, no, I feel like I, I feel like this has become the bitterness hotline, uh, and let's uh, now let's go for at least a slice of sanity on the bitterness hotline. John McMullen joins us from South Jersey. John, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Well, give us give us a little sanity here as to what we're doing here. <laughs> so, all right, so they make the move. I'm not so sure anybody's surprised by this, but the question is, what do you do with it? So let's start with what was your reaction to the move with Doug Peterson? Well, you kind of knew it was coming after uh, the report leaked out on Sunday. You knew this would be the end game. And um, it it really started uh, last January, to be honest, and uh, when Doug was forced to fire Mike Rowe. I, I, I think that was the nexus of all of this. Uh, And then we got here uh, again, and and Jeffrey Lurie sort of puts the same foot down, not allowing Doug Peterson to make his own decisions when it comes to the coaching staff. And he finally stood his ground, uh, defended that hill, uh, and ultimately uh, Jeffrey Lurie decided to move on. Uh, It's pretty astonishing. It's unprecedented in, in the modern era to win a Super Bowl and be out three years later. Um, it's not a good look for the organization. I'll just say that. Now the question is, what do you do from here? Well, I, I mean, obviously the Eagles are behind the eight ball, and it was interesting. You know, Jeffrey tried to downplay that yesterday. Getting, you know, essentially there are uh, six other teams looking for head coaches, and for all the talk about this league and about owners will often talk about candidates and innovation and um they all pick from the same list they they, it's the same guys getting interviewed in the same cities robert sala is uh you know the eagles put in an interview request for him he might take the jets job today uh and, and then you have arthur smith who's had a number of interviews uh, and on and on, and even Todd Bowles, who's had a few interviews outside the Eagles. They're working off the same list as everybody else. Um, now, I, I do think the home run hire for Philadelphia would be Lincoln Riley. If they convince him to leave Oklahoma, I would have no idea why he would want to do that for this situation. Uh, he makes six and a half million dollars there. I think the safety net is always due Staley. And if you're looking for maybe a little bit of an outside the box, uh, I think Mike Kafka uh, would be that guy, sort of like Doug in 2016. He doesn't have other options. This would be his only interview. This would be the only place that would want him. He he would be skipping steps, so to speak, as a head coach. And that means he'd listen, uh, at least early, to what Jeffrey and Howie Roseman want him to do. The one name I didn't hear you mention, though, that was Eric Bieniemy, who's been a hot name the last couple of years, but is still in Kansas City. I realize it is the same coaching tree as Doug. What is your thought on him? Well, you know, the coaching tree obviously is Andy, and that's the best in football. I don't think that's a problem. I think Eric should be a head coach in this league. I think he's going to be a good head coach. Uh, but I don't think the Eagles are are the path for him. Uh, for a number of reasons. And believe it or not, Deuce Staley is one of them. Uh, You know, the Eagles are one of only a few teams that haven't hired a minority candidate for not only you have to go back to Ray Rhodes as the head coach, who was Jeffrey's first head coach, uh, but also the coordinator positions. Todd Bowles was here for a very short period, but he wasn't hired to be the defense coordinator. Uh, He was um, the interim uh, DC once they fired Juan Castillo, so uh, he doesn't have a great record. Anybody who knows Jeffrey uh, prides himself on progressive politics and things like that, but his record doesn't necessarily stand up to that. However, I don't know how you could pass over Deuce Staley after all he's been through, after all he's done for this organization, 
if you're going to go in that direction. So I think the political winds are tricky for Jeffrey Lurie. So what do you do? I think he's going to avoid them. Uh, now what do you do with Carson Wentz? Is it all dependent on who the coach is? No, I, I mean, I think he's going to be back, and that has more to do with financial decision than anything else. And that's been one of the issues. I mean, remember, it, it's not necessarily the salary cap, and Jeffrey kind of explained that yesterday. People get jump off buildings over the salary cap. You can fix that essentially 12 months. That's one of the few things he said yesterday that's completely true. That's always overrated. The dead cat money is the problem. The dead, excuse me, the dead money overall. I mean, that's right. money already, it, 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 already yeah, budgeted. That, that, that's going to be the problem with the Steelers with Ben Roethlisberger. I mean, that, they're right there. So, you know, I think in the western half of the state, I think they have a good handle on that. <laughs> yeah. So the point being there is, remember, when you signed that contract with Carson Wentz, it's pre-pandemic. You're budgeting as you're moving forward. You're understanding you're going to have this revenue. All of a sudden, you have $200, $250 million shortfall. And on top of that, you're going to say, oh, by the way, just write off this $34 million you've already spent. You've already budgeted. I, I never thought he was going to do it. Uh, I still don't think he's going to do it. And I, whether Doug Peterson was here or whomever the new coach is, He's not going to take that dead, uh, dead money hit. Bottom line. You mentioned the name Lincoln Riley. Does the Chip Kelly experience put a damper on hiring any college coach, or is it just a separate incident? Well, it's separate. I mean, Lincoln doesn't deserve to go down with that shit. All, all you know, but I, I mean, yeah, the comparisons are always going to be there. I mean, that's what people do. It, it's it, you know, it's only because it's a only because it's a college coach. As I said, Chip's his own entity. I got that. Yeah, uh, it, but even if you think about it from a player standpoint, you know, fans will always say, "Oh, you can't draft a Southern Cal quarterback because of so and so," or "You can't do this." I mean, in the scouting community, they always say, "You know, don't scout the helmet, scout the player." I think coaches deserve to be evaluated on their own. But I, I, I do think, um, I, I, first of all, from Lincoln's standpoint, as I said, I don't know why I would want to leave Oklahoma for this situation. Uh, right. I would think he would certainly have to have guarantees that he would have uh, more power uh, than they gave Doug Peterson. And then you gotta ask, you got to ask Doug Peterson questions. He's got to call Doug Peterson. Remember... The odds of any coach coming in here and and winning a Super Bowl in year two is pretty low. And then, but let's say you accomplish that, you you got a leash of three years after you win a Super Bowl. That's gonna take it. That's gonna make any coach take pause. This is not a good situation for the Eagles. It's also not a good situation because there's a lot of holes to fill too. Uh, since the coach was let go. Were you surprised Howie Roseman survived? Oh, no. <laughs> Anybody who spends any time around the Eagles knows that he was never in any peril. For whatever reason, Jeffrey trusts him. If you go back, you know, people talk about uh, Chip Kelly winning that power struggle. He didn't win. Remember, Jeffrey stayed with the organization. You ever see somebody fired, stay with the organization? Well, he got a he got a new title, a raise, and a bigger office on the other side of the building. And essentially a wink, wink, wait, and, and we'll see this guy implode and we'll put you back into position. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. Um, he's not going to make that mistake again, Jeffrey Lurie I'm talking about. For whatever reason, he completely, implicitly trusts Howie Roseman. Guy's got more pelts on the wall than any other NFL executive I've ever seen. He just constantly churns through and wins these power struggles. And, you know, Mike <laughs> Lombardi wrote about it today. He had, a, he had a great line. He said, you know, if you're a coach and you're talking about this situation, you got to realize the GM isn't your partner. He's the partner with the owner. And that's another yeah. issue. He just got a lot of issues when it comes to – there's only 32 of these jobs. I mean, somebody's going to take it. But the point is, if you have options as a coach, this is a really, really bad situation. 
Huh. All right. So since it's a really bad situation, how far are the Eagles away from getting to a playoff based on the current situation? Uh, well, Jeffrey himself said in, in the most convoluted – I mean, when have you ever seen an NFL owner say the coach got fired? He didn't deserve to get fired, and he got fired because he's planning on trying to win in 2021. <laughs> Uh, that's what he said, uh, and he used the term transition phase. Uh, so the Eagles are, are, are clearly gearing up for a rebuild. Um, and look, in the NFL, it's not you're not talking about a decade. That's if you right. make good decisions, you can turn this thing around pretty quickly. Yeah. But the problem is there's been no evidence that this regime – when it comes to, to Howie Roseman, at least recently post-Super Bowl, of stacking good decisions. So that's that's your biggest problem. <laughs> so Yeah, it, like, if it's done right in this league with draft position, scheduling, you can get back in year three. The question is, is there any patience to get to year three? Yeah, I mean, you're right. I, there's worse to first every year in this league. You bring up a good mm-hmm. point with the scheduling. There is such a huge difference from playing a last-place schedule and the first-place schedule, and that's why oh, you yeah. constantly see this juxtaposition every year where teams go up and teams go down um, just because of the schedule alone. You start talking about the sixth pick. Well, you know, it's pretty hard to mess up the sixth pick. So if you're up there, you start adding that talent pretty consistently. Uh, and, yeah, you can turn this thing around very, very quickly. Um, question is, are, again, are the Eagles going to make good decisions consistently? They've done it in the past. Maybe they can start doing it again. Maybe they just needed uh, to hit control all delete so to speak, and reboot this thing. But I mean, this is an organization that was looking for a championship since 1960. I I can't say this enough. They finally get it, and they fire the coach inside of three years. That's such a bad look to me. I I can't even express it. I know it's a limited sample size. What was your thought on Jalen Hurts? Uh, I thought he he showed some things, but yeah, it's a really limited sample size. And, and the problem is, I think it got progressively worse, and that's understandable. Was you know when you come in, uh, teams don't have tape on you, and then they start to adjust when they do, and it becomes more difficult. That's and right. he in turn has to make those adjustments. It got worse, and obviously week 17 against Washington was really bad. He finished 7 of 20 before they sat him down. But remember, you know, the tackles in that game were Matt Pryor and Brent Toth trying to block Montez Sweat and Chase Young. I mean, you know, everybody was going to look bad in that game. So you have to add that into it too. But I I do think he's got a chance to be – a starting quarterback in this league, but he's, you know, kind of as advertised. He's very, very raw, and he's got a lot of uh, of sharpening up to do, both mechanically and understanding opposing defenses and what they're throwing at. John, an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much. I really appreciate all the time, insight, and analysis. Hey, thank you. Appreciate it. John McMullen joining us, covers him from South Jersey. All right, let's get your reaction. <laughs> He's absolutely right. Everything that he just said, all he had to do, all that Jeff Lurie had to do was get rid of two people, the head coach and the GM. He only got rid of one, and look what's happened. But, you know, but what John said, I'm not here, I'm not arguing with you, but that's not really what John said. He said it's a bad look that three years after the winning of the Super Bowl, you did this. And he he is right, but I, I but I don't think this is not as I don't think this is as big a deal if you if you get rid of both people because then your signal is out. We need we actually won a Super Bowl three years ago, but if you saw if you saw the, how things got bad when you, late in the season and how things ended in the final week against Washington. And he said that control alt delete reference. 
that's what that would mean to me. Then, like, okay, well, it's still not a good look that you're getting rid of, you're making these changes three years in, but at least it's a complete rebuild. By getting rid of one and not the other, and not both, that's where it's bad, and that's where he's correct. I'm going to go 180 of everybody else here. I think getting rid of Doug Peterson was a bad move. I really do. I think that you look at how, you look at the composition of this team. You know, it's the easiest move to make. Okay. Well, I'm not really big on easy. Okay. Not big on easy. I think getting rid of him was the easy move to make. Do I think it was the right move? I'd have waited two more years. He got you to a Super Bowl and he got you to a playoff. Last year, he got you to play off with no receivers. None. Zero. Okay, guys that would not be starting for other teams. I mean, do you think Ward is starting for anybody, you know, a team that's contending? You think Ward is starting? He was your best receiver a year ago. Right? This is this to me comes down to this is a a personnel thing. It's part age part injury and this team ended up being decimated by both and I think to look at him like the quarterback thing ends up being something that's that's a big problem and I think the quarterback thing is in the end what cost him in this thing but I don't think it was the right move I think it's the easy move right but sometimes the right move is the more difficult move. That's just me. It's different from yours. Your commentary on it is exponentially more entertaining than mine. I get a lot of notes here from people. They love hearing you go off the rails. Like, in fact, I, somebody somebody sent me um, some Motrin thinking it was going to, to you. <laughs> Is there anybody else you want fired besides Howie? Oh, I'd love to get rid of the owner, but I know that's not possible. <laughs> oh, just the show is just, oh, my goodness. And the medical right. staff. And the medical staff, too. Yes, let's get rid of the people who are the experts in, the, in their field. All right. <laughs> Neil Kulong and the Steelers' problems next half hour. It's a problem-filled show here on News Radio 1070 WK. Okay. When it comes to car buying, there's the other guy's way, and then there's the SMC way. The other guys force you into a vehicle you really don't want. The Subway Motors way lets you take the time you need to browse, ask questions, and take the test drive and think on it. For over 100 years, the Merth family and all their employees have made your experience the most pleasant one you'll ever have. The other guys won't offer you the best price for your trade, no matter how much they say they will. The SMC way is their promise to provide you with the most money the market shows your vehicle's worth. The SMC way is to offer you all applications applicable factory rebates on new vehicles and generous discounts. Looking for a pre-owned vehicle? The SMC Way checks each vehicle in a 200-mile radius to determine the lowest price, then beat it. It's the lowest price promise, just part of the SMC Way. The choice is up to you. The other guy's way or the SMC Way? The SMC Way wins every time. Sunbury Motors Company in the North 4th Street Auto Plaza, Sunbury, and at sunburymotors.com. Selling more cars and satisfying more customers for over 100 years. You know when I became uneasy about the Eagles this year? Was when Booker got hurt. Thought, oh, that is a bad one to lose. You know, and then Dillard, who's not great, but he got hurt. And then, of course, Lane Johnson had his problems. Uh, then Peters, who was playing guard, I thought, okay, fine. And then he moves to left tackle, wants more money to make the move to left tackle. I mean, when you have that kind of turnover and change in front of your quarterback and you don't have receivers that make tough catches, exactly how do you expect – look, did, did he struggle this year once? No doubt. No doubt. Okay. But his struggles were also accentuated by problems around him. 
Finally, gets a good rhythm with one of the tight ends. That guy gets hurt. Defense was eh, not great. A little long in the tooth in some areas, but the defensive line is really good. Now I'm working with a guy who wants the owner fired. It just it doesn't work that way in sports. You can't fire him.